Thank you all for joining us today. My name is Emma Fay and I'm the CEO of Guildhouse. This evening, I join you from my home office on Ghana and Paramount country in the Adelaide Hills in South Australia. I honour the strong creative culture of our First Nations people and I would like to acknowledge Ghana and Paramount people for their custodianship of this beautiful country. I acknowledge all First Nations people present at this talk, listening or watching the recording. I am very pleased to welcome you to this evening's event. It's an absolute highlight of our revision winter season um, of our speaker sessions. This series of conversations is aimed at increasing connectivity during this ever evolving time of disconnect and to offer an opportunity for artists to increase their well-being, to find new models of sustainability for their practice. Tonight and tomorrow night, you will hear our esteemed speakers reflect on the topic, remodeling our future. Conversations with curators, writers, artists, and arts leaders will investigate how an industry finds momentum and can collectively shape change. So a little bit of housekeeping before we begin, you can ask questions at any time in the chat box at the bottom of the screen, and we'll address this during the Q&A. Or in the chat, you can type, I'd like to ask a question, and we'll turn your mic on at the appropriate time. But aside from this, if I could ask you to keep your mic off as accidental background noise can easily be picked up. And as we're recording the session, that can sometimes disturb uh, the recording. And we will move to questions after the panel members have spoken with us. And so it's my absolute great pleasure to introduce you to our panel members and our speakers for our in conversation tonight, Mami Katayoka and Rana Devonport. Mami Katayoka is the director of Mori Art Museum, Japan. And, of, and has a long and illustrious career as a leader in the arts with a strong presence in the international art scene, including her current roles as chair of CMAM, the International Committee for Museums and Collections of Modern Art and artistic director of the 2022 Aichi Triennial. Many of our listeners might also recall Mami's curatorial presence in Australia for the 2018 Sydney Biennale Superposition. Rana Devonport is, a direct, is the director of the Art Gallery of South Australia and has worked very closely with Guildhouse on a number of initiatives. Welcome, Rana. Rana was appointed as an officer of the New Zealand Order of Merit in 2018, acknowledging her dedication and leadership within the arts. Rana is a curator, writer, and cultural producer whose career spans senior positions within art museums, biennales, and arts festivals, predominantly within the Asia and Pacific regions. Rana is also on the CMAM board, and I know it's been a really active group over this past year, and we will dive into that fairly shortly. We're really excited to host this conversation with you both, and it's an opportunity to, to extend some of the public and global engagements fostered by CMAM. Rana and Mami, I'd like to express my thanks to you both for this session and hand over to you, and so that you can share your philosophies and approaches to leading international contemporary art museums and reflections on emergent curatorial models in the sector. Over to you, Rana. Great. Thank you, Emma. Uh, and welcome to everybody that uh, has joined us this evening. And a special warm welcome to you, Mami. Uh, wonderful Thank to you. connect again, as always. Uh, firstly, I wanted to honour the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains, on whose land I, I stand, uh, and uh, honour their ancestors. Uh, and uh, in particular, their deep and abiding connection with country. So great opportunity to talk, Mami. We are in constant communication on many topics and, uh, and uh, we were just speaking before about how uh, with CMAM, which is the uh, International Committee for uh, Museums and Collections of, of Modern Art, Modern and Contemporary Art, and uh, how that year has changed dramatically. And we'll come to that in a moment. We're going to talk about sort of three things for about half an hour uh, and uh, three topics and then open up for questions. Firstly, we're going to think about uh, international leadership uh, the urgencies, the, the situations that, um, that we're all uh, immersed in at the moment and those very radical changes uh, that are taking place around us. Secondly, looking at um, international networks and how they can help, how they can support, how they can inspire. And lastly, curatorial innovation. And I really want to acknowledge, Mami, you're uh, amongst that um, extraordinary exhibition you've just curated another energy, uh, which, um, so for the, for, before we sort of launch into those topics, I just thought it would be uh, int very interesting for our 
uh, our audience tonight to hear about your situation. You've only just reopened again after another closure and your exhibition opened and then had to close and now it's reopened again. <laughs> so if you'd like to talk a little about the situation in Tokyo right now, yes. particularly yes. in 50, 51 and 52 stories in that tower, the Mori Tower above, um, above Tokyo. Thank you, Rana, and also thank you for the invitation tonight. Um, yeah, Mori Art Museum, we had to close last year uh, from, uh, from February to July. So we literally closed for five months. Then uh, we did uh, one exhibition for the stars to really introduce <clears throat> Japanese contemporary art sort of superstars, including Nara, Murakami, and Kusama, which was originally planned for the uh, postponed Tokyo Olympic. So uh, we were having the star exhibition at quite odd time. Then we had to close for after New Year from January to April, which was our third wave of the COVID, but uh, <clears throat> That was the planned closure for our uh, refurbishment. Then uh, we finally opened uh, end of uh, April, April 22nd, with this exhibition that Rana just mentioned called uh, Another Energy, Power to Continue Challenging 16 Women Artists from Around the World. So we are showing 16 women artists whose ages are between 71 and 106. Then, uh, <clears throat> We have Robin White from New Zealand. And uh, yeah, they all have uh, over 50 years of career. And uh, this is a reflection of this sort of recent international uh, movement or trend of uh, those women artists who had been overlooked for so many years, had been uh, re-evaluated in the last 10 years or so. And uh, there's so many women like that throughout the world. So we just wanted to focus on selected uh, 16 so that each artist could have enough space to really introduce their practices. And uh, we opened that show for three days and then another closure came. So then we closed um, yeah, over the month. Then uh, there was an interesting conflict between national government agency for culture affairs and the Tokyo Metropolitan Government, the like governor, and uh, national government said museum can be open with a limited time. And then after receiving that uh, guideline, different regional cities could make their own final decision. Then Tokyo governor decided that museum cannot open, but uh, somehow she said uh, theaters can open but not the film theater. So there's some confusion and there is a huge argument. Then uh, I discussed a lot with those uh, uh, people from the <coughs> Tokyo Metropolitan Government. Then finally, yeah, we could open just yesterday. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Uh, one of the uh, one of the very useful documents I think that CMAM has produced in the last year uh, is is a, a document that literally says why should museums remain open and operational. And um, going back to that, you were just saying, Mami, um, that uh, you've actually used that in your argument with government. Mm -hmm. And I'll just sort of refer to uh, the topics that were discussed. And, and the basis of that was um, interviews and surveys with um, many participants um, in CMAM. And um, the priorities were uh, the uh, one, museums are safe spaces, the scale of exhibition spaces, temperature, air controls, as well as crowd management makes museums some of the safest public spaces. Museums are established very clear protocols and guidelines to enable both staff and visitors to remain safe in the museum and workspace. Uh, two, museums are an essential service. And this is something I think we've all been thinking about in terms of essential and non-essential and how uh, vitally important museums are in individual and collective well-being. Third, museums are drivers for economic recovery. And we're not gonna go down that path tonight of the value of economic, the economic impact of museums, but of course it's extraordinary. And, uh, and cultural, um, cultural tourism, of course, uh, 
pre-COVID uh, was the, the, the most um, expansive area of, of, muse of, um, of tourism increase. Number four, museums can act collectively. And I think this is a very interesting one to offer a common position and voice, to be stronger, to stand collectively, to push forward our voice, uh, to, uh, to support each other. And I just have to say, uh, the, the, the programming at um, most of the state art museums in Australia would not have been possible without a very uh, significant increase in the level of support that we've all been giving each other with exhibitions, you know, for example, the Clarice Beckett or the loans from other state galleries. We've lent a tremendous number of works to other galleries around the country. And I think uh, that, that this sort of collegial uh, and, and collective spirit moving forward is something that, uh, that is, is palpable and, and very heartening. Um, fifth, museums can adapt. They're, they're, we've all adapted so responsively and, and, and uh, in so many ways to the, to the new environments that we're existing in. And also the importance of museums maintaining dialogue with government. And as you just mentioning, Mami, that you know, even when a situation of, of um, municipal and uh, national governments not seeing on the same page. Um, in the interview that was, um, uh, 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 that went out to many of the, uh, museum directors, one of the questions was, what would you say is the future of museums? And I thought I'd just um, read that out. It's just a couple of lines. And then over to you, Mami, in terms of where uh, international leadership uh, in museology sits at the moment. So the question was, what would you say is the future of art museums? And my response was, since the first museum was arguably founded by the Mesopotamian princess and priestess in Inagaldi Nana 2,500 years ago in the city of Ur in today's Southern Iraq, the socially minded, idea gen generating, object focused vortices of cultural activity have continued to morph as they've lurched from being locales of passive absorption of knowledge to being discursive fora for new ideas and generative sites for the social imagination. If art museums are to continue to in their most relevant and vital form, how they must know um, where they are and who they are connecting with. They must listen hard to artists, be immensely curious and provide active platforms for new research, making and ideas. These trajectories should ensure a vital and open future for museums. So just really interested um, in given, you know, what you've experienced and also your consideration of uh, curatorial practice as well as museum leadership, Mami, and, uh, and, and, and also that idea too about listening hard to artists. So over to you. I think, it, I think it's been very important time for all of us, the museum practitioners last year to really come together and question what is the essential role of the museum. And just as um, Rana said, that how museum could be socially minded and how we can um, try to be connected with the social political condition of our surroundings, but also the whole global situation. And um, uh, one thing we could uh, say is something that happened uh, like Black Lives, Lives Matters. And uh, it really sort of arose the awareness to those, uh, the race issue and the really long sort of gender issue and all of these have been discussed for so many years. And uh, uh, yeah, I did some research when I was doing a Sydney Biennale that uh, second Sydney Biennale in 1976 was already discussing about uh, indigenous issue and then also gender issue. And uh, it seems like we're still on the same page, but are somehow sort of circulating the same place. <laughs> but uh, at the same time, now we are all globally connected really well. So uh, this wave of uh, Black Lives Matter and then also uh, Me Too movement since 2017 came over to Japan. And uh, maybe you might have heard that a former Japanese Olympic Committee chair uh, said something about the women in the sort of the, um, the looking down the women's position. 
So uh, normally, probably Japanese society had been sort of set back and uh, so polite that they, they didn't probably raise their voices. But this time, we were not quiet and silent. And then we spoke up and they ended up that he resigned and also new uh, chair came, like a new women chair came in. So that was a major change. And uh, those changes has to be reflected in the museum practices as well. It's a natural reflection or re response to the museum. And then I think a museum, future museum has to be continue to be like that when the whole world is so uh, complex and uh, intermingled with their own political historical issues. But at the same time, there's so many things that are we can uh, discuss together and find a solution and also help each other. Mm. And, and thinking, you know, and I think in a lot of ways, um, Black Lives Matter, you know, 25th of May last year really has been as equally impactful as, um, as the pandemic, in, you know, in certainly 77% drop in museum visitation last year, there was 230 million the year before and only 54 last year, but also with Black Lives Matter and, um, and the shifts and changes and particularly thinking about those concepts of, you know, idea, inclusion, diversity, equity, mm -hmm. accessibility, and, uh, and, and, and also this idea, think, thinking about world building, how museums can actually contribute to uh, the discussion about worlds can, where worlds can exist. I was part of a discussion recently and academic Sarah Rifke talked about every artwork is a school, how, you know, every individual artwork can, can manifest itself with the questions and, um, and uh, that it couldn't generate. One of the things that I've been thinking about a lot is um, is thinking about shared compassion, empathy, kindness, and slow looking, and mm -hmm. uh, and that need for responsiveness. You know, um, Edward Glissant talks about in the museum is um, uh, thinking about the archipelago of worldliness and difference, um, and. Uh, and, and maybe if we just move uh, to what CMAM you were mentioning that uh, this CMAM board are probably, you know, meeting more often than any other board uh, through various reasons. And I'm working with the sustainability group and also the Museum Watch and just thinking that um, in this really challenging time, there's been a lot of changes with particularly in Australia with universities and how a lot of the museums are really struggling in those contexts. And there's been a lot of... Um, a, a lot of morphing of um, museums roles and a lot of instability and right now the Wellington City Gallery is facing a really difficult time of a of uh, both the uh, the director and the senior curator uh, their their positions are di disestablished and I know that um, that uh, with the museum watch is participating as, a, as an advocate in that context um, so so um, how have you found, you know, as as the the lead, not only of you know one of the most interesting um, contemporary art museums in the world, but also your role as Seaman Mami? Um, there's many other subcommittees, um, and and can you talk about what what the surprises have been, and 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 uh, and and how the the last year has um, evolved into a different place? Yeah, I think uh, I had been sort of uh, observing the whole activity of CIMAM uh, because uh, we have like such a great colleagues in the board members, including you, Rana, and uh, we have sustainability work, working group and then also how to uh, find the connection with ICOM and uh, how to find the best practices of the museum around the world and so many different, and also museum work. There's so many different uh, working groups and the 15 board members are part of at least two or three working groups. And uh, um, they have their own sort of uh, autonomy in a way that they, they can have sort of intimate discussion among five, six members. But uh, every month, every two months maybe, we meet as a board meeting and this uh, Zoom system, online meeting system, made it really possible for all of us from really around the world to meet regularly and discuss. And actually before pandemic, the board member of the CIMAM only happened 
three times a year. One is part of the annual conference. So uh, at the time of uh, Hong Kong at Basel, and then also maybe uh, Venice Biennale, and then uh, November annual conference. So now we, we, I feel that we're much closer and uh, we are more intimate in the way that we have different branches and discussions that are always cut sharing with the rest of the board. So I think the system is running really well and the people think the president is really busy, but it's actually I'm sort of observing the whole great activities and just trying to connect everyone when it's necessary. But otherwise, I think, uh, yeah, it's, it's not only uh, uh, most hardworking board, board members, but also the most probably engaged with the uh, individual issues. And uh, something like Museum Watch, it's so necessary around the time like this, that there's so many uh, problems uh, diverted from uh, COVID-19 and all other things. But it's so difficult for museum pr practitioners to try to solve those issues on our own, what with one single director or museum. But it has to come from a, a relevance from global voices. And uh, CIMAM is a global voice. And uh, it is really connecting over 500 members. And uh, the only thing that we can find is that there is no right answer that CIMAM has, but rather it's you find that you're not alone to be facing to these difficulties. And I think that is a, the greatest beauty of CIMAM. Mm -hmm. One of the uh, things that is has been um, interesting last year is uh, the, the little book, The Future of Museums, 28 Dialogues that Andres mm -hmm. Santo um, it, it interviewed 28 museum directors. And I found it really inspirational to be finding out about museums that exist in so many places of the world, particularly um, South, South America and Africa, where uh, people have been um, radical and, uh, and very vulnerable, I suppose, in how they've approached the idea of what museums can be. And I think um, this, this, we're now entering a time of that, um, of, of great potential in terms of museological practice. I'm thinking particularly about uh, about um, how and and Victoria Northen, who used one of is one of your curatorial advisors for Aichi, and how when they were faced with closures uh, and in her work at the Muse Museo Moderno in Buenos Aires, she actually commissioned 200 artists working in theater, literature, visual arts, music, and film to make online projects, which reached 6 million people over a six month period. Uh, and so, as she said, working at enormous velocity to respond to our diverse communities. And I think that sort of expansive, uh, the expanded practice, you know, um, moving beyond what is known and what is comfortable into unknown territory, I think is something that um, that is very exciting moving forward. Um, now, thinking about uh, curatorial innovation, so, uh, and, and Unji Ju, who is also one of your curatorial advisors, uh, and she talked about recently about the notion of the past, the present, the possible. And I thought that was a kind of a lovely rubric to think about curatorial practice. Um, so you've mentioned a little about another energy and the fabulous, you know, Carmen Herrera, who just had her birthday a couple of days ago, astonishing painter, but you're the, uh, the curator for the Aichi Triennial in 2022 called Still Alive. And you're taking a very different approach to curating a large scale international survey exhibition of contemporary art. So can you you speak to that, Mami, because you have a, a wonderful family of like-minded souls that you're, you've gathered around you to embark upon this curatorial journey. Yeah, I think uh, <clears throat> the one of the reasons that I, I decided to accept that offer was because of the COVID. It, and uh, when I did uh, Sydney in 2018, I was traveling myself throughout the world, except South America and uh, Africa, um, because my principle had been really to meet 
the artist in person at the studio or wherever they are working so that I can sort of understand the whole environment of uh, including a climate and also history and, and society and everything and what sort of ground these works are being produced. That was my main focus. So this time I had to go totally opposite so that I don't go to the um, I don't go to the physical sort of research, which I don't have that time probably now, even I could be trouble. So I decided to uh, ask uh, the, all those curators who I have seen their biennales and exhibitions, and I really admire and, and the respect from around the world, and to ask, um, by asking them uh, to uh, submit to uh, uh, re recommend around the 20 artists from the region. And then I'm making a selection of maybe four or five artists. And uh, it's been just simply so great, including Rana and uh, Victoria and Unji and all those people. Um, I have beautiful more than 300 artist lists in, in front of me without physically traveling. But also it was surprising to see um, how many great artists are around the world, which I have no idea. And um, um, so I decided to uh, sort of work more with the artists that I don't know. It's easy for artistic director to just start listing up all the artists of your favorite, where you have worked with, so that you can assure the quality of the works and everything. And uh, I have, yeah, thought about listing up all my artists and it was easily beyond 100. So uh, no, 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 I can already imagine what kind of Biennale or Torinale it's going to be. So it's not so interesting to me. I want to meet unknown artists and a new finding, new learning. So uh, yeah, now I have one of the sort of pre preliminary list of uh, different locations and uh, I thought it's really possible, even after COVID, that we work together instead of one single curator or artistic director, try to be a champion of the whole five continent. And uh, not uh, every Biennale to Trinalis is enough budget even for an artistic director to travel around the world and also the time. So uh, it's most effective way um, to do a world survey and uh, uh, yeah, I think uh, it's, it's quite interesting after uh, thinking about that system and actually doing it is a great fun. Hmm. And uh, also Maury is uh, trying to hire a junk curator who doesn't have to live in Tokyo. And then I was also speaking with um, Francis Morris at Tate and they are also considering few adjunct curators who lives in different parts of the world. And actually, it's more important to have for us someone living in Europe and always constantly looking around what is happening in Europe and sharing the information instead of someone from Europe living in Tokyo. That was the same experience that I had when I was working at Hayward Gallery in London, that I was constantly expecting something from Asia. But if I am in London, I kind of lose the contact with like on time what, what is happening. So this model of sort of curatorial advisors or adjunct curator model could be something really useful in the future while not traveling, but still try to be internationally connected for museum practice. Mm. And you've entitled the uh, triennial Still Alive, which, you know, it has many connotations, of course, given the year we've <laughs> all had. But um, can you talk a little more about uh, the concept? Yes, of course. Um, uh, <clears throat> I'm kind of, um, how do you say, um, uh, I, I, I was invited as kind of like a firefighter have since last time in 2019, there is a huge fire at, around the um, IT Triennale. And um, many local people thought that uh, contemporary art is something really risky and difficult and uh, 
uh, we shouldn't really touch. And some of my, my friends who are being a teacher in local IT schools, then the teachers didn't tell students to go to the trainale because it's not good for the education of the children. So there was something wrong with this understanding of what is the uh, contemporary art is all about. So uh, I wanted to really bring back the pride of our IT people by <coughs> Uh, looking into the most in, one of the most important conceptual artists from Aichi, uh, On Kawara, um, who has this series of telegram called uh, I Am Still Alive, that he sent out these short messages from 1970s to 2000, and, uh, and to, uh, yeah, uh, almost uh, 900 telegrams that he sent out. And uh, this simple phrase, I am still alive, is something that probably we shared for last year, sending your friends, are you okay? How is the COVID in your, in your country? Well, I'm surviving, I'm still alive. So being alive to ensure that your friends are alive is so important in the last years. So uh, yeah, borrowing that idea of I am still alive, I took just still alive part and thinking about uh, idea of still alive, if you think uh, history, then something could be still alive now. But also if we, if we think of the future, then something might be still alive in the future. And uh, so it's really uh, looking into the principal idea of uh, time and space. And as Rana quoted uh, what Unji said, it's a simple time frame of a past present. And the future is so important. It's probably too simple, but uh, this is something that we are all thinking about. Mm. And then also to think about uh, our given time has a much longer time frame. So Onkawara has 100 million years books that are people start reading out aloud. And uh, yeah, I know Onkawara for so many years, like so many people. And, uh, but somehow after COVID, his works started to speaking to me again very strongly. So those changes of our perception is also quite important. And Rana also recommended such a beautiful list of artists. It's hard to choose. But. <laughs> That's very sweet. Well, the artists are the ones that are, are the shining lights. But you you made a really interesting comment, I thought, Mami, and I know we're, I'm going to hand over to you in a second, Emma, because to for the questions. But um, Mami made a really interesting comment because, you know, I've lived and worked in Japan and I know it's 99% monocultural in Japan. And, um, you know, it's a very, very different environment. And just thinking about artistic practice here in Australia, um, not only... Um, Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander practice, but um, you know the extraordinary number of of artists who were born elsewhere, and uh, and you made the comment, Mami, that it's like Australia is is a microcosm of the entire world. Yeah. You yeah. look at artistic practice taking place in this country. You're actually connecting with the entire world, which you know only someone not living here would have that perspective. I think. Um, on that on that note, Emma, um, it's probably a good good time to hand over to you. I know that's gone really fast. <laughs> it's gone really fast. Thank you so much, both of you. What, I've got so many things I'd like to ask, um, and I know that other people will be mulling on their questions. So whilst you're thinking of your questions and typing them into the chat box, or please just flag that you'd like to speak up, and we'll we'll hand over the mic if you like. Um, Rana, I actually also wanted, I wanted to ask you, um, it's been wonderful to hear Mummy's reflections on curatorial innovation with the AT Triennial and it sounds so incredibly, I love this idea of adjunct uh, curators and this idea of the advisors and I, I love the idea that you're going to glean more by having people in those places in those countries but Rana, is there other examples that you have um, reflected on over the course of the last 12 months through the CMAM network and actually brought to bear in, in Australia through the Art Gallery of South Australia? Uh, well, certainly, I think the, the recent example of Clara Speckett that I know a lot of your, um, your guests who were with us tonight might have seen. And I think thinking about the, the kind of experience that people want now, and particularly about slow looking, and I know I mentioned that at the beginning of the discussion, but also how spaces can, uh, can offer something, uh, you know, the, the shared space 
of looking, but also, also the shared space of thinking and, and certainly recalibration. I mean, we're all, you know, thinking about decolonizing museums and indigenizing collections, but also re recalibrating what uh, the uh, art historical canons and, um, and, and giving attention in a different way and shining a light on, uh, on our histories and, and, uh, and the complexities. And I think, uh, those um, for those curators who are working with collections, how those collections can still be uh, re-energized. And I, I love how Mum is talking about Onkawara. You know, you think you know an artist, but everything can look different. And and how uh, how those artists can shift and change as the environment changes. So I think you know, bringing in 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 a lot of ways. I mean, that exhibition would not have happened without COVID in some ways, you know, because the the energy that we put into it, the fact that we've been starved for ten weeks away from the museum, the 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 level of craftsmanship and our, you know our artisan workers and how they gave everything of themselves to that project, and you know, with the uh, Simone Slattery, the musician who is normally in Europe at this time, was able to, you know, create a soundscape in the space. And, you know, even in the, on the last day, and, you know, the, we, we received more than double the numbers we expected. And even on the last day, walking through the spaces, I always say goodbye to the exhibition. And um, you could have heard a pin drop, you know, there was an air of reverent rapture that one doesn't often see. And, uh, and, and how museums can offer um, our soul such nurturing at this time um, was um, inspirational and, and inspiring. And also going deep, going deep into a collection, going deep into our own research and our um, knowledge and giving you know, curators and most importantly artists the platform um, to, to, uh, to reconceptualize the world around them and, and our past. Mm, thank you so much. I um, just, I was really curious, I would love to unpack a little bit further about the CMAM Museum Watch subgroup. And I mean, it sounds like it's a very powerful group of people that you have in that collective board. Um, and I, I was just reflecting on that example of what's happening in Wellington at the moment. And I am a bit curious about what kind of, um, uh, sort of without sounding too dramatic like what subterfuge is happening what things may be happening because of COVID or at, at, under the guise of COVID and um and how this uh, this group CMAM but also other groups within the arts are you know forging collective voices and and how we're shifting the dial and bringing attention to things so I was just wondering if you wouldn't mind Rana if you're on that subgroup sharing a little bit about how that group is mobilizing on issues like this. I think I might hand over to Mami and um and in in the case of with, with uh, the Wellington City Gallery, um, there's a really great advocacy group that are working out of Wellington to, to bring awareness. And, uh, and, and then it's, 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 my understanding is, you know, with Museum Watch, it's monitoring situations and working out how uh, advocacy might be able to make a difference. So, but I think over to you, um, Mami, to talk more about mm -hmm. Museum Watch. Yes, I just uh, shared the link to the museum watch page of the CMAM on chat so everyone can see it. But uh, there have been quite a few things that we kind of advocated through the, the channel. One is, for instance, in Mexico, that are most of the museums are funded by the government, but they have been uh, cutting the budget for 50% since a few years. And then after COVID, they cut 75% of the museum operational budget. So uh, they mm -hmm. are kind of hired still, but uh, they cannot even think about programming something new. And uh, also some of the very important uh, museum directors have been politically dismissed. And those cases are like, quite often happening. Mm -hmm. So the CIMAM is the only voice that we can sort of internationally sent a letter to the uh, head of the municipal government or uh, uh, minister of the culture that we that just to tell them that we are watching mm. and uh, then uh, we are delivering these international voices then even one of the uh, museum uh, director who was uh, 
who was fired sort of came back to the position after some months. Mm. So uh, we are really making, uh, yeah, really some uh, records of uh, doing something and uh, making things change. Thank you. It's so important that we have these collective voices um, and, uh, you know, there's, I guess, uh, um, advocacy and agency runs at multiple levels and um, I'm reflecting, I'm thinking a little bit about your, the Sydney Biennale that you curated, um, Mummy, and the, the commentary that I've heard you speak about that, that, that particular exhibition around complex ecosystems and knowing how each of our organisations and our collectives understand our purpose, but also understand how we can work together and that more collective organism sort of sense to affect greater change. Um, I have a couple, a couple of questions popping in um, from Jane. Mami, I'm very excited to look up your latest exhibition, Exhibiting Mature Women Artists, and want to thank you personally for placing us in the spotlight. Um, a question there is, you know, is the exhibition online? Um, and just a comment there about quite often the young artists are the ones in the limelight, which is understandable, but it's wonderful to see mature, established female artists celebrated at this level. Um, yeah, actually, uh, women artists uh, of the longer career is really under spotlight. There's so many artists like that getting the first uh, retrospective in the mu major museums in the last 10 years. And uh, I did some walkthrough on our Instagram account. Mm -hmm. So if you could go to the Moria Museum Instagram account, and uh, there are a couple English tour that we made, I made this week and last week. So uh, you can have a look. Fabulous. And uh, then you have to be confident about what you have done. And uh, all those women artists are quite interesting to see that the, the, one of the reasons why we, we call it another energy is that they are passionate and full of energy, but that energy doesn't go to sort of um, competition with other artists who are trying to be on a superstar on this sort of hierarchical uh, contemporary art field. But rather, I think uh, it's energy goes to yourself. And uh, they had been uh, just pursuing their curiosity and questioning the meaning of uh, sculpture and all this artistic uh, uh, explanation. And some are, of course, like Suzanne Lacey, have been an important figure to look into the, the development of feminism and, and also mm -hmm. all these uh, social issues, but not all. So uh, we were also trying to be avoiding that when one, one makes a women show, it often really becomes about the women, about uh, sexuality, women's body, but we wanted to be also away from it, but not completely sort of denying it. Mm. Delicate. Well, yes, absolutely. I think that's the, the, the territory that needs to be charted, which I'm, you know, I'm, I will absolutely be looking at those uh, Instagram walkthroughs. I've got a question here. Um, Inika would love to ask a question if we're able to release Inika's mic. And, and also just wanting to add to what mm. you are saying, Mami, and, you know, I remember seeing a terrific exhibition um, at the Pompidou uh, of Women Artists uh, a couple of years ago, and also, you know, the number, you know, with Hilma of Klimt and Eileen mm. Agar and uh, recently, you know, um, Artemisia Gentileschi in London. You know, there's so many terrific exhibitions of women artists happening around the world, mm. uh, but, but also, we've got a long way to go, you know, and the most Googled artists in 2020, there was only two women artists. Um, they were still absolutely in the minority, Frida Kahlo and Artemisia Gentileschi. So, which was really interesting and in how that has brought awareness um, of, of that artist. But also just to make um, reference to the fact that the uh, last week, the Louvre uh, pre new president announced a woman first time since 1793 when the Louvre was, um, was so this needs to happen on all levels. It's not um, it's not only having women in these positions, but thinking about diversity with boards and uh, and also thinking about uh, art, artistic practice and uh, and providing those platforms for artists too. I might just actually that I, I want to move to another question from someone else, but I wouldn't mind seeding that as a question to come back to is um, in terms of what the future is asking from um, global contemporary art museums, are we looking for a different sort of leader? Does leader look, has it, has, does it have a different shape and form in this new era? So we might come back to that a little bit further. I know we've touched on that a little bit, 
But Inika, would you like to jump in now? Um, yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, thanks, Mami and Rana. Um, that's been really great to listen to. I think this kind of leads on from the point you were just saying there, Emma, but um, I'm just picking up on a number of things that have been said about, you know, moving into unknown territory, working more with artists that you don't know, um, the, you know, the really listening to artists. Um, if you can't tell, I'm, I'm coming from the artist perspective in all of this. Um, for me, a lot of the, the sort of common thread in all of that is the role of risk. Um, and I'm just interested as to how you're both thinking about um, the role of risk and the, and the museum in today's context, because it seems like we have, there's sort of been a, a renewed democratisation of museums and um, around the world following, you know, sort of particularly the past 12 to 24 months um, and, and how, um, a breaking down of those barriers between artists and curators in the institutions um, allows for, for perhaps even more risk to be taken. Yep, great, great question. Mami, yeah? No, no, please go ahead. Yeah, um, I'm, absolutely. And I think, you know, the projects that I've worked on that have been most powerful and most uh, world shifting in terms of perspective and learnings have always been those projects that are massively risky and and have um, taken the museum into spaces of vulnerability and unknown territory. And I think um, it, it is, as you say, Mama, you know, you can rattle off a hundred artists and, and, you know, know what you're getting. Of course, it'll be different, but, but I think um, thinking and, and in a way, um, Emma, thinking about the question you are asking as well, you know, of what's important and thinking about empathy, vulnerability, curiosity uh, and research. And I think, you know, risk is also asking those questions and, and actually be, not being afraid of doubt, not being afraid of not knowing the answer. Uh, and, and I think, you know, artworks are, are, are portals to questions and uh, do take us in places we, we didn't know existed. So um, we're here because of artists, museums exist because of artists. So I think always artists will lead us to, um, to those questions that we may not even know we need to ask. Hmm. I also think that uh, particularly after COVID, it's so important to communicate really well in depth conversation, even over Zoom, that with artists and also uh, other supporters, like with everybody that are even within the museums, among staff, that are because we don't physically meet, then uh, these online conversation, um, we, it's, it's harder to sort of read your facial sort of emotion and all these uh, uh, physical sort of uh, energy. So uh, yeah, I'm asking my staff to try to communicate at least 10% more than you used to. Mm -hmm. And uh, even with the email, don't make very simple like lines. You have to explain the context, why you're asking this and what would you like to know and all of this. And uh, I think that level of care matters in the end, particularly in these kind of time. And that's one of the way to sort of challenging the risk, but also avoiding unnecessary risk. And well, in some respects, I read from that, you know, minimizing the harmful risks and maximizing the creative risks, you know, that there, you know, yeah. that care is at the center of that, I think is a really beautiful sentiment. Um, Polly, have we got any other questions coming through that I might've missed? I have a, I'm just sort of trying to scan at the moment. In the meantime, I might just, um, I, reflecting on even the, your, your appointment um, as the president of CMAM Mami in 2019, um, you're the first non-European president to be appointed. We've talked a few, in, in a couple of contexts in this, this conversation, we've talked about firsts and some big shifts. And, and I think this is a little bit about what I was getting to around the new face of leadership. Um, how has that felt for you and how, what has that meant for the, I guess, the, the focus or the locus of, um, of control, if you like, around how co the contemporary art museums are thinking about the, this, uh, the global phenomenon and mm. where we sit? I think, um, yeah, I have been a lot of uh, first 
Like I was first um, Asian artistic director for Sydney Biennale after mm -hmm. 43 years. And, um, but I think uh, those things didn't happen because of myself. It happened because it was already uh, the time, the time for that. Mm. So for instance, CIMAM had been changing from 1960 to its inauguration to now, and we are celebrating 60th anniversary next year. And over the course of the time, it really started from as a sort of museum director's uh, friendship group among uh, your, uh, European and North American museum director boys. And, uh, but it's, it's not that kind of group anymore for a long time. Mm. It has been such a global gathering and having uh, long-term directors, but also new generation of young directors from uh, non-Western regions and such a mixed uh, group. So uh, it was just about the time or even overdue to have someone not from Europe. I and I think it was the same for Sydney Biennale. That was really about the time. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, any closing remarks from you, Rana, or any other questions that you would like to pose before I wrap up? I'm conscious that we're reaching the end of our session. Sure. I mean, Mami, you mentioned about uh, going back to um, Onkawara and re renegotiating him in a different way. Can you share information about an artist, a Japanese artist who has come to your attention over the last year that you're really uh, excited about just as a little kind of mm -hmm. window into uh, artistic practice in Japan right now, which was always fascinating. Um, yeah, I was, uh, I was looking at the artist like uh, Meiro Koizumi, who is the great, uh, I'll write it down. Thank yeah, you. you can look up his name, but he is a great um, uh, the artist who works with the video and then also uh, we are the new technology, but he's very, very good at uh, sort of excavating human emotion in really from the bottom, like in depth. Mm. And normally, or oftentimes, he uses the non-professional actors and actresses in that storytelling and then asks them to act as uh, their emotion shift from acting to actual emotion from the bottom of the heart. So those kind of uh, uh, the in-depth uh, practices becoming something touches people's mind in this kind of condition. And maybe not non, non Japanese, but uh, the artists like a Wolfgang Leip, who uses the flower pollen, who's very well known already, but uh, thinking about the vulnerability of human life and then all kinds of life, then looking at his flower pollen piece and then also milk stone, and uh, bee wax sculpture, all of these materials or substance that is going to form new life in the future, mm. starting to look so beautiful. I introduced this work to one of the TV program in Japan that just talking about how the way we look at art really changed after COVID. So uh, that was uh, my recommendation for that program. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I am going to just, I don't want this conversation to end. I feel like I could ask you a thousand questions and we could keep going and I'll be uh, keeping a much closer eye on the CMAM website and bulletins because I think that there's a lot going on that I'm you know, very intrigued by as would many of our guests here. But I would like to thank you all for joining us today and it has been an absolute delight. Um, for those who have attended the session, we'll circulate a little survey and we'd really love to hear from you about your feedback to the session. Um, and the information that we glean from these, these feedback sessions uh, really do help us shape the future of these conversations. And we are in a position at the moment where we are nearing the end of this, this remarkable program called Revision, which we designed to, um, to meet the needs of artists in our community post, post COVID, even though we're actually still living COVID, absolutely. 
Um, and we're in the moment actually in the midst of our annual appeal, we're seeking funds from our community, from our supporters to help us con continue to evolve this program and continue to support artists through this time where we can connect with global leaders and minds, both artists, writers and curators. Um, and I just want to let you know that in the next two, next day, we have two more sessions. We've got uh, an incredible session with uh, doctors, multiples, uh, Kristen Alford, Connell Lee and Adam Drogelmeyer speaking about digital intimacy and digital connection. And tomorrow night, we have a session led by Esther Antelidis with Kelly McCluskey, Sally Blackmore and Makeda Duong. So I encourage you all to keep listening, keep connecting. Thank you so much, Mami. Thank you so much, Rana. It's been a really wonderful conversation and I hope you all have a beautiful evening. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. Thank you, Thank you very much. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye.